सन अधिनायक जया हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा रावण उत्कल बंगा विंद हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्छल जल वितरंग तब शुभ नामे जागे तब शुभ आशीष मांगे गावे तब जय गाथा जन जन मंगल गायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे टुडे on the occasion of the first convocation of the university i read out the citation the watersheds of 6 july 1935 heralded the birth of his holiness the 14th dalai lama of tibet tenzin gyatso born in an agrarian background in north eastern tibet into land his holiness was discovered as the reincarnation of the 13th dalai lama tutan gyatso when he was merely 2 years old he commenced epistemological quest in his infancy and went on to attain the highest buddhist educational degree jeshe larampa which means doctorate in buddhist philosophy at the age of 23 years <laughs> the superhuman mentoring prowess of his holiness tutelage is stands vindicated by the rigors of time and history he was anointed with the honorous responsibility of leading tibet at a tender age of 15 years backed by millions of followers his holiness was cornered into political exile that led to his making india a home on 31st march 1959 that continues to this day under his iconic leadership the tibetan community has inseparably integrated into the indian melting pot while maintaining its unique identity and ethnic richness a universally respected spiritual mentor he intricately used the balanced middle way approach to enunciate seminal breakthroughs like the five point peace plan the strasbourg proposal and the charter of tibetan in exile at international forum unaffected by his overwhelming political spiritual apogee his holiness is a devout proponent of timeless noble values such as humanism religious harmony and the right of self determination for millions of displaced tibetan notwithstanding his towering charismatic stature his holiness considers himself to be an ordinary buddhist monk in a humble self deprecatory manner he defines himself as a temporal in charge who keenly looks forward to relinquish his vantage in favor of tibetan democracy and he has done so his painstaking leadership culminated in internationally resonating adoption of three resolutions by the united nations general assembly in 1959 1961 and in 1965 that formally recognized the suppression and injustice perpetrated upon tibetans the strength of his firmly grounded resolution to use peace non violence mediation and persuasion as a means to resolve international problems was formally acknowledged when he was awarded the nobel peace prize in 1989 <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat>
as a chivalrous, unarmed, unflinching vanguard of fundamental rights, progressive nationalism, and emancipation, he is an epitome of exemplary statesmanship in the contemporary world. Above and beyond the Tibetan cause, this visionary has dedicated his mind, body, and soul to the higher purpose of safeguarding humanity and the Almighty's creations. Infinitely propelled by altruistic and secular ethics, his transgressing concerns for humanity and the world at large gets reflected in the form of his commitment towards global environmental conservation conservation. As an entrenched interdisciplinary scholar par excellence, His Holiness has used wealth of his life-changing globe-trotting experiences to author over 75 books and scholarly writings. Against this backdrop, it is not surprising to see that His Holiness has been inundated by hundreds of prizes, honors, and awards from across the world. His deeply reflective, yet immensely practical erudite contributions span a broad range of contemporary and pragmatic aspects like peace, nonviolence, interfaith dialogue, secularism, peaceful coexistence, humanism, sustainability, and universal responsibility. His followers span on unimaginable and incredibly broad spectrum of social, political, temporal, geographic boundaries. The Central University of Himachal Pradesh considers itself privileged in anointing this apostle peace, His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet, with the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, DPhil Honoris Causa. <laughs> On this red letter day, marking the first convocation of the university. By virtue of the authority vested in me as the Vice Chancellor of the Central University of Himachal Pradesh, I request, Honorable Chancellor, that you may be pleased to graciously confer upon His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, the honorary degree of Doctor of Philosophy, DPhil Honoris Causa, for his outstanding contributions and services. University. <laughs> Then frankly speaking, I don't like too much formality. <laughs> Reason, since my childhood, uh, according to Vedan tradition, that young boy is put on throne and everything, very formality. So I fed up. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, too much formality sometimes is to create additional barrier. Not much use. After all, we all same human being. Uh, and most important, everyone want a happy life. And everyone have same right to achieve happy life. We follow different sort of professions or different ways to achieve that goal. That's happy life. 
So now, now we should be serious how to achieve happy life, meaningful life, sensible life. The very purpose of education is actually uh, reduce our ignorance uh, because always there is gap, appearances and reality. So education suppose reduce this that gap at getting fuller knowledge about the reality. Because our aim, goal, happy life uh, must achieve through realistic approach. Just wishful thinking. Right? Wish, wishful, or even sort of prayer. Of course, I'm Buddhist monk, and my daily life, I do pray. And in fact, every day, about five hours, prayer, meditation, meditation mainly, analytical meditation, analyze. Uh, However, the real effect must come from action, not just desire or wish or even prayer. So therefore, if our method or way of approach become unrealistic, then no matter what sincere motivation and reasonable goal will not achieve. So, the very purpose of our of education is to fulfill that goal and getting fuller knowledge. The goal, the path, how to achieve. And also it's in, in, very important to know present condition. Without thinking the present sort of condition or states, just thinking about method or goal also become unrealistic. So we have to uh, get fuller picture about what the present condition. And on that basis, how do we build happy life? Then I think firstly, uh, I want to express my deep say, congratulation those students <laughs> who got this, this degree out of your sort of lot of effort. And also, I think, immense help from kind teachers, professors, or these teachers. So I would like to express my congratulations. And then, also, I remind my own sort of case. After sort of, uh, several years study, the final examination, uh, I a little bit excited <laughs> and also a little bit anxious. <laughs> I think you also have the same experience, isn't it? <laughs> so I think because uh, of that lifetime, life in a life, the now you already got or reach certain level, you more or less accomplished your study. Now real life, eventually real life start, begin. In a way, while you carry study, uh, school or college or university, still you see there's a certain sort of way is something because of the fixed, right? And take for granted. Now your real life start, no guarantee. Everything depends on yourself. Uh, so life, not easy. So, uh, right from the beginning, I think better, you see, uh, to keep your mind or 
things will be more complicated, more difficult. Uh, uh, so then must, you see, uh, prepare emotionally, or things may not be easy, so that when is a certain difficulty, certain obstacles you say happen, because you already prepared in your mind, will not disturb much. If you take for granted, uh, things will be okay. And some sort of obstacles happen, then too much sort of disturbances, too much even sort of sadness or discourage, these things happen. So that I would like to share with you. How oh, then? Oh, I think within short period, as your uh, sort of report you mentioned, I think short period, I think you really achieve, I think marvelous sort of uh, achievement. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Now I want to share uh, some of my sort of uh, feeling or view. India, uh, Arya Bhumi, we usually call Arya Bhumi, the great nation. Uh, even population wise, uh, I think after China, India, <coughs> great sort of populated sort of nation. In the meantime, India become most populated democratic country. Uh, and naturally, very important uh, for whole Asia, even for whole world. Then if you look back past few thousand years, I always feel this continent, I think a continent where most great thinkers, philosophers produce this continent. No other country, no other continents. As far as I know, 3,000 since I said, was around 3,000 years. Uh, very sophisticated philosophical views is it developed in this continent. That, that goes through several centuries. Of course, my own knowledge is very limited, but according to my sort of rough weather, limited knowledge compared Egyptian civilization, Chinese civilization, and eventually civilization of this continent. I think as far as uh, sort of certain sort of views or concept uh, about reality uh, in various levels, I think most sophisticated philosophy developed in this, this continent. That's clear. One time, one great Indian scientist, I think nuclear, nuclear physicist, the Raja, Kaza, Raja Ramana, once he told me, he found, I mean, he read some Nagarjuna's text. Uh, see, he found there the concept of quantum physics. In, in, the, in the world or in the West, quantum physics is something new, recent centuries. But then he told me, in this country, before 2,000 years, already develop the concept of quantum physics. He, as an Indian, he feel very proud. So now my own sort of experience, 
as a result of meeting with many scientists, many Western thinkers or philosophers. The quantum physics and some of the ancient Indian sort of city concept. There are many similarities. Uh, in fact, when we study, when we d discuss these things, uh, it becomes very clear, mutual benefit, mutual learning. So this country, I think in the past, really made tremendous contribution regarding the sharpness of human mind. Philosophical field and the logical field, right, logician, right, logics field, really. So sometimes uh, we debate, I always describe, chela or student of those ancient Indian thought or Indian philosophers. So sometimes I have joke, half serious. I usually say, telling, we are not only chela of Indian guru, but also we are quite reliable chela. <laughs> reason, reason. You see, these very sophisticated sort of deep philosophy, including Buddhist philosophy and the Sangha philosophy. Jain philosophy, uh, as far as Buddhist philosophy is concerned, you see, in 8th century, 9th century, the great master from Nalanda institution, his name is Shantarakshita, a great philosopher and a logician. He invited by Tibetan emperor, 8th century. He introduced you see, uh, Buddhism according to Nalanda tradition. So the Nalanda tradition is uh, combined philosophical views and logics. So Shantarashita himself, great logician, all his writings, he always used reasons uh, like that. So in any way, therefore, I, I mean, so while our ancient guru's own land, a lot of ups and downs happened. During these centuries, we, your chela, kept all this knowledge intact. <laughs> so, so that's the uh, uh, reason I usually call we are quite reliable chela. <laughs> so, all you say, our knowledge actually come from India. Uh, so therefore, sometimes we really feel proud. The real t living tradition of Nalanda Sarvarsade thought, or Nalanda sort of academic Sarvarsade uh, tradition, we kept till now. So these are not only ancient sort of uh, culture or ancient sort of the knowledge, but also very relevant to today's world. So thinking these things, or oh, India, really, uh, Bharat, really great sort of uh, nation. Now, past greatness, <laughs> uh, when we read history, oh, really admire. But uh, not much effect, <laughs> present. So present now, uh, what, we, what, what we should do, particularly to you, our guru, Guruji, young Guruji here. <laughs> now, combination, ancient Indian rich sort of thought, right? And modern sort of thought, modern education must combine. Uh, if you simply copy the modern education from the West, 
actually in this country, Britisher introduced this modern education. Wonderful. Without that, we cannot develop. It's very important. But at the same time, you Indian should not neglect about your own thousand year old traditional because of the treasures or this because of the uh, richness. That I think is very, very important. So another word, modern education really, you see, looks oriented about material value. Uh, we are human beings. Uh, not only just physical, but also emotions there. So material value provides only physical comfort, not necessarily mental comfort. Sometimes I feel those educated people's mental state and not so educated uh, people's sort of mental state. Sometimes I doubt. More educated, more sophisticated mind, perhaps more visions, more expectation, more kasada, ambitions. Uh, as a result, more jealousy, more distrust, more anxiety. So result, the very educated person, but in a world, too much sort of anxiety. And that eventually leads to depression, loneliness. So, number of my friend in the West, very good education, economic condition, money matter also, very good, but as a person, unhappy person. It is fact. Uh, so therefore, now in the West, among the, the some sort of medical scientists and some great sort of scientists as well as thinkers, or philosopher, see many of them now uh, get some kind of sort of now experience, you now material value. There is a limitation. Material development alone will not develop healthy individual, healthy family, healthy community. So therefore, because the very existing education system is very much oriented about material value, this is not sufficient. We have, as I mentioned earlier, we have this emotion. So now, ancient Indian sort of, uh, or said the knowledge, is really dealing with our emotion. So once, in order to deal with emotion, I usually used to call hygiene of physical, hygiene of emotion. So in order to deal with emotion, so we, we should have some knowledge about world of emotion, world of mind, world of consciousness, with a fuller picture of the world of emotion, then much easier deal with this destructive emotion. So that is your ancient sort of treasure, available, all this information. That I think very, very important. So, my main sort of reason, combination, your ancient thought, ancient treasure, and modern treasure, well, modern thing combined. Then you get sort of physical sort of comfort as well as mental comfort. <laughs> so now India, after uh, independence, generally this country, most populated democratic country with the rule of law, and freedom of speech, uh, freedom of press. I think overall, this country much stable compared to neighboring states and some other states. 
Uh, however, time passes. I often use it telling the spirit during freedom fight, like Mahatma Gandhiji, Sada Patel, all these sort of great sort of freedom fighter. They really stand principle with principle and carrying that sort of principle fearlessly, selfishlessly. Now, after India got independence now, uh, nearly 70 years, now that spirit, I think, still need. Otherwise, now, frankly speaking, corruptions, quite serious. Uh, so this, I think, uh, we are gradually losing our basic values or basic principle, truthful, honest, uh, even selfish viewpoint. Uh, if you carry your work truthfully, uh, honestly, then your action automatically become transparent. That brings trust from public. For your own sort of interest, honest, truthful, uh, it's very, very essential. Doing something hypocritically or cunningly, uh, ultimately you will lose. Clear. So therefore, I think in India, there are some sort of let's say, symptoms or some sort of indication of some or result of our, some negligence. That I think the, you, you younger generation now must pay more attention. Few years ago, I was in Jodhpur talking some to the students. One student then usually whenever I give some talk, I always see, uh, take questions. So one young student, young boy, Ask me one question. At the moment he study. After he finished the study, uh, when he really sort of real life start, unless involve corruption, I cannot lead my life. Can 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 I sort of succeed without corruption? That kind of question. I a little bit shocked. After a few days, I was in Bombay meeting some sort of my friend, some businessman. One businessman also, you see, mentioned, without corruption, your business will not be successful. That's very sad. The corruption almost has become something happy to read. Some take for granted these things. I think that's a mistake. Uh, we, have to, we have to tell. We have to recognize these things are uh, can, can change, can overcome these things. Mainly, uh, I usually call my generation, including those professors, <laughs> chancellors, <laughs> my gener our generation is generation of 20th century. So our century already gone. You, these young students, see, you truly belong to the first century. To the first century, uh, only 30 years passed, or what? To 12 years passed. The remain, remaining of the century yet to come. So you have special responsibility and a special opportunity, uh, you see, to try to make this 21st century be century of peace, century of love, century of compassion, then many man-made problems will reduce. Nature disaster, we cannot do much. If we uh, develop more sort of sense of concern of others' well-being, then there is no room to cheat other people, to bully other people. Isn't it? To exploit other people. 
then all these as the wrong as the habit rates. All these gradually is reduced. So in order to develop moral principle, if we rely on religious teaching, effect limited on this planet, uh, religious faith over four, uh, 3,000, 4,000 years. Religious faith? Come. Really, it, it brought immense benefit to millions of people, even today and future also. But still, 7 billion human beings, quite big portion out of 7 billion, actually non-believer. And among those believers also, not very serious. So among the religious people, some corruptions, some scandals happening. That's indication. Those believers, not very serious. Religion take as a sort of kasota, habit rate, or custom rate, or custom, like that. So therefore, uh, now the only way to build healthy society, healthy humanity, or compassionate humanity must go through education. So education, please, you see, think more seriously. And particularly teachers, you must sort of make clear your students ultimate source of happy life, successful life, and also ultimate source of, you see, the friendship ultimately depend here, warm-heartedness, not money, not power, not just sophisticated sort of inter uh, intellectuals. So therefore, please, you see, the concerned people pay more attention while you are giving them education, as I mentioned earlier, mainly material development, concerning material development. Meantime, you must pay more attention about how to build, how to build, you see, healthy person. That means more compassionate person. More compassionate person, automatically, sense of responsibility automatically come. Uh, sense of community automatically come. So these are, uh, I think, something important. So, uh, now here, well, uh, young, but a university with long future and very important sort of institution. This institution actually producing uh, one generation who really makes differences of your own area and as well as to the country and global level. So please think more seriously these things. You, you, you give me this honorary degree as a philosophy right now. So actually my own sort of knowledge is very, very limited. And when I actually used to carry study, I remain a very lazy student. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes I really feel uh, whether I'm because of that, really worthwhile receive this uh, honorary. Uh, but great honor for me. So thank you for that.